Dankeschön, thank you. I will speak in English. Uh, I would like to speak about Tenge's second period, about Tenge's uh, phenomenology of expression, uh, experience, and within this uh, field, I would like to concentrate on his theory of subjectivity. That's why I uh, uh, try to treat the problem of unconscious. <coughs> so, in contemporary phenomenological research, there is a widely held conviction concerning the self. The self must be interpreted, first of all, within the framework of self-awareness. The operatic problem of the self, is it a substantial being, or is it constantly and radically changing, or is it a mere illusion, might be solved by reducing it to an undeniable experience. We can always distinguish our experiences and thoughts from the experiences and thoughts of the others. Therefore, that is the conclusion, we can speak of an experiential core self, experiential core self, which is supposed to be the common denominator of the phenomenological theories of consciousness, the Husserlian intentional consciousness, Heideggerian Jemeinigkeit, Sartrean, cons Sartrean conscience de soi. The experiential core self has no ecological structure, it is neither the Cartesian ego nor a pre-given transcendental sphere. It is considered as a phenomenological factum of pure self-awareness. We are constantly aware of our experiences and of the fact that these are our experiences and non not someone else's. This theory was born within the debate between phenomenology and analytical philosophy of mind. The first accepts the first-person perspective, the second either denies it, no self-theories, or accepts it in a very abstract form. Mind is that special ontological entity to which I have private access, which is always and necessarily <coughs> perspectival, and which have phenomenal character. <coughs> so. <coughs> The experience of core self can be a phenomenological foundation of the self-experience and self-understanding, but only if it has some concreteness. In itself, it is so abstract that it has uh, uh, no, 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 no content. And I think that Tengei uh, tried to elaborate uh, a, a more concrete uh, phenomenology of subjectivity, so it was not... Uh, satisfied with this theory of uh, experiential core self. In that presentation, I would like to speak about his second phenomenological period. I would like to analyze, following Tenge's argumentation, the relation between the process of formation of sense and the unconscious in general. Even more precisely, I would like to concentrate on a central <coughs> problem of contemporary phenomenology. How can we treat with phenomenological method and with phenomenological tools, something which is beyond phenomenality, the unconscious. Let's begin with the concept of experience. I would like to start by underlying what is at stake in a new phenomenology of experience. Tenge was never interested in an abstract theory of consciousness. What is at stake for him in the re-elaboration of phenomenological conception of experience is the problem of subjectivity. And here at that point I would like to uh, make a preliminary distinction between three aspects of, of the self or of the mind. The first is consciousness, the second is subjectivity, and the third is person. Consciousness is a phenomenological concept or problem. It is epistemological and ontological at the same time as he and its main character characteristic is intentionality, so its relation to the world and to the objects. Person is an, is an existential concept. So <coughs> uh, when we speak about person, we speak about uh, someone's own life drama, uh, angst, despair, love, etc., etc. And we speak, when we speak about person, we, following the Kierkegaardian line, we speak about paradoxes. So uh, the main characteristics of, of, of the person is, the, is, is its paradoxical uh, structure. Now the third uh, concept 
is for me the more interesting or more intriguing. This is subjectivity. <coughs> when we speak about subjectivity, it means, according to me, it means a dialectical relation between known and not known uh, moments. It implies a dialectics. And, uh, and it is beyond, that, that, that would be uh, the point at the end, it is beyond the diacritical method. So with diacritical method we can approach uh, consciousness in phenomenological term, but maybe we cannot approach the subjectivity if subjectivity has a dialectical structure. Dialectical in the sense that subjectivity involves always known and not known uh, moments and, and the development uh, uh, in time. Okay. So I would like to uh, speak first about uh, Tenge's conception of experience, then about uh, his uh, approach to unconscious. The reasoning of Tenge's book, Erfahrung und Ausdruck, uh, leans on Hegel's and Gadamer's insight, separating the concept of experience from a traditional conception according to which experience is nothing else than application of general concepts to sen sensual perception or uh, a kind of scientific epistemological activity. Experience, according to Tenge, brings something new which has never been seen and thought. All genuine experience have the character of novelty, cross or expectations, and happens behind the consciousness, that is to say, independently from the intentions of consciousness. Such a conception attaches not only great importance to experience, but points out at the same time its rarity, which means that not all of our everyday experiences bear novelty, the surprising and unexpected moments of sense formation. Nevertheless, experiences in that specific sense are not only borderline cases and extraordinary versions of everyday perceptions, but these are the real experiences. These are the real uh, cases of experiences in the sense that uh, such experiences constitute and form our life. I quote Tenge, not only mere erlebnisse, but experiences in pregnant sense constitute the history of a life." End of quotation. Nevertheless, an experience in pregnant sense is not only application of concepts to sensual data, nor activation of psychic dispositions, but an event in specific sense. Tenge's philosophy of experience can be, n can be linked to the concept of event, since an event is something which happens without being aimed and initiated by somebody. Such an experience is not part of the possibilities of a given moment, since according to its definition, it crosses and what is more, it violates the actual ex expectations. That means that it can be considered, con considered unimaginable or we have even to say it is impossible. On the impossible. Okay. On the other hand, with the experience, not only something surprising and unpredictable appears, but the consciousness itself has a lapse for a moment. In other words, the real experience as an event implies the eclipse of consciousness. It is evident that the process of formation of sense, Zin building, in such cases cannot be traced back to the intentions of a sense-giving consciousness. The formation of sense among and behind conscious intentional acts, which means independently of them and often against them, is called by Tenge interintentional formation of sense. Experience originates exactly uh, from some kind of surpluses. As Tenge uh, uh, writes, when interintentional formations of sense take place, the correlation of consciousness and reality breaks down, their balance overturns. Suddenly, a multiplicity of protoforms of sense appear, and the consciousness cannot keep up with the speed of their multiplication. Such a surplus of sense appears which is not a correlate, such a surplus of sense appears, which is not a correlate of any conscious intentions." End of quotation. Nevertheless, that surplus 
that excess, being at the same time the surplus of sensibility over understanding, the surplus of the concept over the synthesized data, and the surplus of language over perceptual sense. Th these are the, the main forms of di diacritical uh, separations. <coughs> uh, that surplus is far from being previously given. It does not exist previously uh, at experience. It, beco it becomes constantly. That conception of experience opens up the ways to two fundamentally important philosophical problems. On the one hand, to the better understanding of the relation of consciousness and mind independent reality. On the other hand, to the phenomenological reinterpretation of the relation between consciousness and unconscious. So first, some words about the concept of reality. Reality in Tenge's phenomenological approach is not only the subsistence of objective and consciousness independent being. Our concept of reality can be interpreted in multiple ways, such as our concept of experience. It is because in that approach, reality and experience are twin concepts. They, they are mutually related, in other words, they are correlates of each other. Obje object of experience is the reality, and reality opens up only for a special experience. The modern concept of reality has been determined more or less by the natural sciences. Reality is the being, describable in physical terms. It means the totality of things and state of things describable <coughs> by the laws of physics. In opposition to it, Tenge could refer to the spiritual, cultural and social reality thematized by human sciences, but he does not. He conceives reality in a different way from both natural, natural sciences and human sciences. The concept of reality, according to the phenomenological method, can only be approached in its relation to con consciousness. Reality is which breaks into consciousness, which transforms the system of our expectations and leads to new insights. Reality is such kind of strangeness which surprises consciousness. According to this, rea according to this reality does not mean the objective subsistence of mind-independent being. <coughs> I quote, phenomenology breaks with the presupposition of the ready and objective structure of world, and it does not conceive the world as a totality of things and state of affairs. And, end of quotation. Things are not things in themselves and mere physical things. Thing is not that which cannot be reached by the epistemological efforts of consciousness. The real sense of thing exiles uh, itself declares Tenge in attaching, in attaching him philosophy, in attaching his philosophy to Hegel and in opposition to transcendental idealism of Kant and Husserl, the real sense of thing in itself uh, and reality is nothing else than the following. Although it offers itself for the conscious activity and for the consciousness, it takes shape behind the consciousness. End of quotation. The new concept of reality can be characterized by a special movement. It takes fixed forms, then it becomes again fluid, then it takes another fixed form, and so on. So this conception of reality is very much influenced by Mark Ritchie's uh, phenomenology. <coughs> the reality is not only strange and unexpected for the consciousness, but fluently ambiguous. Its essential characteristic is that it cannot be exhausted and stabilized, stabilized in conceptual way. No, about, about unconscious, some words about unconscious. The new concept of experience leads to a specially phenomenological interpretation of what we call in general unconscious. Through the event of experience, even if only in an immediate way, the phenomenological unconscious appears <coughs> as well. Nevertheless, that later concept of unconscious does not coincide with the well-known concept of unconscious elaborated by psychoanalysis. It is a tempting possibility to try to understand and elucidate the formation of sense, the Zinnbildung, revealed by phenomenological analysis, 
uh, of experience through the Freudian concept of unconscious. However, Tenge does not consider this possibility as a fruitful way. Even if he refers several times to possible parallels between phenomenology and psychoanalysis, he sees at least one decisive point where they differ considerably. Phenomenology tries to grasp the process of formation of sense, the Sinnbildung, during real experience, whereas psychoanalysis as theory tends to situate and interpret all experiences in the framework of a symbolic structure. Freud has founded the concept of unconscious on the suppression of sense, while Husserlian phenomenology investigates the, appear the appearance of the sense. So suppression against appearance. The former, the Freudian approach, analyzes the sub subconscious manipulation of symbolically fixed senses the later, the phenomenology, uh, uh, analyzes the origin of new sense through wake up of sedimented senses or formation of, uh, of senses. There are some contact between the two conceptions of the co unconscious formation of sense, but we cannot speak about coincidence at all. The phenomenological theory of unconscious aims at grasping the movement through which the streaming multiplicity of experience tends to break open the surface of category of fixation of sense. One of the most important and richest thread in the tissue of the book Erfahrung und Ausdruck is that of the elaboration of the concept of phenomenological unconscious of or of some moments of a phenomenological unconscious. Tenge does this through analyzing such phenomena as otherness in, expe in experience, eclipse of consciousness, the experiential core of uh, alienation, madness, instinct, ur impression, retroactivity, desire, and so on and so forth. <coughs> These concepts often appear in very different fields still outline a quasi-consistent conceptual network of the phenomenology of unconscious formation of sense. Tenge analyzes several times the structural difference between phenomenological and psychoanalytical conception of unconscious. In contrast to Freud, Husserl does not conceive unconscious as a center or source of energy which affects the consciousness, and the starting point of this affection is the unconscious. It has nothing to do with conscious activity, intentionality, or synthesis. Husserl conceives unconscious as a stock or residuum of sedimented senses, which is actually out of reach of the consciousness, but it is, theoretically, at consciousness disposal. In contrast to this conception, the, the essential feature of Freudian unconscious is that the way which leads from conscious sphere is that is is that the way which leads from conscious sphere to unconscious is blocked. According to the principle of all principles, Husserlian phenomenology cannot accept a concept of unconscious to the contents of which consciousness has not any access, not any intuitive or experiential access. Husserl does deny the existence of unconscious mechanisms, uh, for example, in, in an appendix to uh, cr crisis book. But he classes the cases analyzed by psychoanalysis, hysteria, repression of sexual contents, etc., among anomalies. By unconscious, by unconscious, he means the not known, the half forgotten, a content sinking in obscurity, and not something which is structurally op opposed to the actual uh, conscious self. We should not think that it is a sign of the blindness or naivety of phenomenology. And in this respect, Tengei gives his vote for phenomenological tradition. Uh, it's, it's evident. According to him, Freudian unconscious is nothing else than a mythic construction. For a serious and methodological based phenomenological approach, it cannot be only a mythic construction. Because the existence and constant effect of unconscious contents remains without intuitive covering. 
So Fundamental Energy has no access to this uh, kind of uh, conscious contents or unconscious contents. As I mentioned, what is at stake for Tenge in his phenomenology of experience is nothing else than a theory of subjectivity. That's why unconscious plays a significant and special role in his investigation. The undeniable fact of self-awareness opens the way only to an abstract experiential core self, without subject, without concreteness, without even an ecological structure. Tenge was always interested in concrete subjectivity. That is why he went into the theory of narrative I identity and into the theory of traumatic subjectivity. But with both, uh, he, was, uh, he was critical in, in some way. So just uh, some words about, uh, about theory of narrative identity and, and his critiques on it. Ricoeur distinguishes, as we know, Ricoeur distinguishes two sorts of identities, sub substantial identity, memory, and personal identity, ipseity. Trying to grasp the dynamic structure of the selfhood, Ricoeur recognizes the, the shortage of theoretical approach. He affirms that the identity of the self consists in practical responsibility for his or her, or her own acts. The self constitutes itself on the one hand as the protagonist of his or her own stories, and the other hand as a person responsible for his or her acts and for other persons. The distinction between idem and ipse, between sameness and selfhood, can be treated only on the level of temporality. Their difference is a difference between two forms of permanence in time. Ricord goes further and doubles this distinction by saying that idem and ipse tend to coincide in the case of the character. Character uh, is uh, a combination of permanent habits and acquired identifications, while selfhood free, frees clearly itself from sameness when we speak about a person who keeps his word. So for Ricoeur, person is an, is an ethical concept. Person is who keeps his word. Character and keeping one's word are two models of personal identity. In the first case, sameness and selfhood coincide almost perfectly. My character is something almost objective. Uh, in the second, only selfhood is determinant, my personal will and ethical responsibility. Uh, between the two forms of permanence in time, only the narrative identity can mediate. And the, and, the med and the mediation between the two forms are a dialectical meditation in Ricoeur's philosophy. In opposition to Ricoeur, Tenge thinks that there is no need to a dialectical med med mediation between the two relatively fixed poles, between character and keeping one's word. He chooses the opposite way. Nothing is pre-given in a fixed way during the process of experience. That is why dialectical medi mediation is not necessary. According to the dialectical method, the, according to the diacritical method, the categorically formed moments of experience and the moments of novelty are mutually determined. A narrative identity is nothing else than the result of the process of constant changing. Narrative self is the result of the spontaneous formation of sense and at the same time the structure which stabilizes in a ret retroactive way the process. So not dialectics but diacritical method is needed according to Tenge. <coughs> the problems with uh, narrative <coughs> identity uh, are the, the following. First, there will always remain a certain tension between real life, which is contingent, put together from heterogeneous events, occurrences, and narra na narrated life. This later is always threatened by the danger of becoming solely a fiction. Second counter-argument against uh, narrative theory. We can similarly say that a kind of tension will always remain between concretely lived experience of the self, this is the phenomenological experience of a core self, and the protagonist as a character of a life story, which happens to be my life story. The first belongs to first-person perspective, the second to a third-person perspe third perspective, 
to a kind of cultural perspective. I tell my story to the others, so I have to uh, 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 apply concepts, uh, symbols, etc. Et a third counter-argument, <coughs> what guarantees the clear distinction between true narrative and false narrative? The internal coherency of a story is no guarantee of its accuracy. It must be externally coherent as well. In other words, it should fit with the narratives told about me by other people. It should fit with the present situation, not only to the past situation. And it should fit with narrative transcendent facts. Uh, I think that the so-called no-self doctrines, Hume, Nietzsche, Early Husserl, Dennett, are not right. We have a kind of a self that is more than mere experience, mere uh, experiential course, but it is not completely and exclusively narrative either. The main question is, why do we retell constantly our stories? Why do we retell constantly our stories? Uh, neither because unpredictable new events happen all the time, it would only imply the same story plus a new event, plus a new event, plus a new event, nor because the actual end of a story changes retroactively the whole, Hate, for example, hatred uh, at the end of a love story changes retroactively its beginning, I think we retell our stories because there are always moments that exceeds our narrative and cannot be integrated into our life narrative without tension. So these uh, moments are always there, but uh, like, like uh, haunting the, the narratives. So that's, that's the way we uh, arrive to the second uh, big theory of subjectivity considered by uh, Tenge as well, traumatic subjectivity. Uh, that is why we have to take into consideration external factors that determine the subjectivity. Besides community, social relation and tradition, first of all, trauma. The concept of traumatic subjectivity is based on the philosophical insights of Emmanuel Levinas, and it can be traced back also to <coughs> psychoanalysis, to Freud and to, to, to Lacan as well. According to, his to this conception, elaborated among others by Rudolf Bernet, subjectivity is not a pre-given substantial being, but a result of past events which cannot be integrated to the world of conscious, conscious subject or might have never been present to his conscious mind. For Levinas, the relation to other in its basic form is a traumatic relation. The other does not appear as a normal phenomenon, but he reveals himself as face. The milieu of this meeting is not the phenomenological milieu of visibility, it is language. The other appeals me, demands to me, speaks to me with his or her face. The other as face questions my self-sufficient well-being in my world. The traumatic character of alterity is always linked by Levinas to the figure of other and always interpreted in the ethical context. Rudolf Bernet has tried to elaborate a conception of traumatic subjectivity which is, unlike by Levinas, not based necessarily on ethical relation. The subject can be and effectively is traumatic without the ethical demand of another. What does trauma mean in general? Uh, it has at least four basic characteristics. First, it is an event in which subject comes into contact with something completely alien, unknown, unpredictable. Second, the strangeness of this event is not an abstract, remote strangeness, but it touches the subject in the very center of, his, of its existence. So it is very important for, for him or her. Third, the trauma deprives the subject of its security. And four, the subject has no answer to the traumatic event. So he cannot put into his life story. The trauma brings always about a strange relation between the subject and the traumatic phenomenon. According to Freud, the subject can neither forget the traumatic event nor represent it in memory. 
The representation of the event remains on halfway between oblivion and memory. The subject cannot represent it, which means the subject cannot integrate it within the system of representations. So in the Freudian model, the subject denies the reality of the phenomenon by repressing it. Lacan presents differently the process. The subject tries to integrate the memory of a traumatic event, but the integration is necessarily imaginative. The trauma remains real in the sense that it neither belongs to the imaginary sphere nor to the sem symbolic sphere. It haunts the subject and his attempts to integrate it, uh, and his attempts to integrate it are completely <coughs> hopeless. While in Freudian model the subject denies the phenomenon uh, to protect his own integrity, in the Lacanian model the phenomenon itself denies the subject as uh, real denies what is imaginary and illusionary. What is the benefit of the theory of traumatic subjectivity comparing to narrative identity? The theory of narrative identity suggests that the self is master in his house. He sees the essential features of his life, he chooses between important and not important experiences, he controls his life. But we all know that we do not control completely our own life. On the one hand, because unpredictable events happen all the time. On the other hand, because we are unpredictable to ourselves as well. The concept of traumatic subjectivity has two possible interpretations. Uh, we have to distinguish clearly. First, subjectivity is traumatic if and only if it passively suffered some traumatic event. In that narrow sense, not all subjectivity is traumatic, although each are structured in narrative manner. Second interpretation, in a broader sense, we are all traumatic subjectivity. Not only a violent effect from outside can be traumatic, and trauma does not imply exclusively an immemorial past event which can be neither represented and situated uh, in symbolic knowledge. According to psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis, already the birth and the separation from the mother is a traumatic event. This kind of trauma has nothing to do with knowledge, with representation, with understanding, with life history. It happens on the level of affectivity. The theory of traumatic subjectivity answers some questions opened by the theory of narrative identity. For example, why do we retell our stories? But it, it has its own difficulties. It has no good answer to the question, everyone has traumatic subjectivity or only the ones who really experience the trauma. If everyone has traumatic subjectivity, then the concept of trauma seems to be dissolved in a vague generality. If not everyone had traumatic, uh, has traumatic experiences, then some people, the normal, balanced individual, do not attain the status of subjectivity. Okay. Uh, how many times do I have? You have no? <laughs> no more? <laughs> it's up to you. I mean, we have 15 minutes for... To okay, discuss. five minutes. Five, five more minutes. <coughs> uh, I would like to s uh, say some words about the... the the problem of dia diacritical method. Sinnbildung und Sinnstiftung are always and necessarily linked together, according to Tengei. We have no intuitive and immediate access to the essentially incoative process of formation of sense. The diacritical method does not point to dialectical oppositions. It is supposed to show that the process of formation of sense and that of fixation of sense, Sinnbildung, Sinnstiftung, similarly to differential relations among ling linguistic signs, are carried out only mutually within one and the same genetical process. It is not dialectics nor relation between <coughs> complementary elements, but diacritical interdependence. Uh, at this point, uh, a methodological question arises. I would like to ask the following question. <coughs> does, the critical, does the diacritical method not narrow down the scope of genetic phenomenology by allowing always only one step back uh, in relation to intentional uh, acts, in, in relation to fixed senses? 
we can step back only one level in relation to the given actual intentional system of senses. In the formation of sense cannot be considered in itself immediately, only in differential relation to the actual fixation of sense. But if it is so, then do we not, exactly because of the methodological constraints, smuggle an implicit isomorphism into the description of the process. By the way, that was the problem of, uh, of Merleau-Ponty. How can we uh, attain the level of pre-given uh, pre or uh, uh, pre-predicative by supposing uh, the predicative. Is it possible or not? <coughs> Given the methodological limit of understanding pre-predicative only in its necessary relation to predicative, the question seems to be more general. Uh, how can one avoid, um, how can we liberate genetic phenomenology from patronage of static phenomenology? Today's and similar questions, Tengei gave a clear answer in a debate around his book in, a hung in Hungarian Philosophical Review in 2008. I quote Tengei. From my part, I think, wrote Tengei, that from the point of view of diacritical method, formation of sense and fixation of sense can be differentiated but cannot be separated as different moments in themselves. Formation of sense takes place only within the framework of an actual and effective fixation of sense. In that relation do I see the principal cause of inseparable connection of static and genetic phenomenology. There is no way of jumping immediately in the middle of formation of sense. Nevertheless, we can shed light on the process of formation of sense within the limits of given and actual fixation of sense. The diacritical method opens up a dynamic difference, but it does not solve this difference out of the context of contrastive analysis and does not transform the process of becoming to an independent principle, like in the philosophy of Bergson and Deleuze. That was, uh, so not, not only psychologism, uh, but, but, but a kind of speculative philosophy of, uh, of, of becoming uh, was alien to Tengei's uh, approach. The source of dynamism in narrative structure is due not only to unpredictable external events, but also to internal tensions, to unintelligible holes in the narrative tissue, and to desires and, to and thoughts that cannot be integrated to our actual narrative identity. The unconscious in the main is the main source of the constraint of constantly retelling our stories. On the other hand, traumatic subjectivity means that we have an affective, an, 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 an affective sphere which can be traumatically alien to our conscious ego, even in the case when we are not effectively uh, traumatized. There are holes in narrative structure, annoying and problematic moments which cannot be integrated into our actual narrative selves, self or can be integrated into it, but only in very problematic manner. Sources of such holes can be either an external source, this is a traumatic event, or an internal source, non-representable desires, unintelligible affective moods or blind spots of our relation to others, etc. We can conceive a phenomenological unconscious which is not based on repressed Vorstellungen, like in, uh, uh, in Freud, and which is uh, refuted by uh, phenomenologists because it supposes the double consciousness b b beside uh, uh, consciousness but based on an unconsciously schematized sphere. The unconsciously <coughs> schematized substratum of subjectivity can be either a personal affective unconscious or an unpersonal cultural unconscious, <coughs> which is named by uh, Richir a uh, uh, symbolic institution, institution symbolic. This schematized sphere means a kind of constant alterity to our narrative identity and a kind of traumatically alien aspect for our conscious uh, self-awareness. If we try to give an account of person's subjectivity, then we have to take into consideration, besides his own narrative story and his self-altering and self-producing trauma, also this kind of affective 
and cultural unconscious. The theory of affective unconscious does not aim to refute the narrative and traumatic <coughs> conception of subjectivity. It tries to shed light on their internal and structural problems. The concept of the invisible and schematized affectivity and cultural um, unconscious implies a concept of unconscious which, on one hand, contrary to classical concept of consciousness, has nothing to do with repressed representations and does not lead to a supposition of a second consciousness behind the conscious consciousness. And on the other hand, seems to be more appropriate to give an account of the dynamism of the subjectivity. But at the point, Tengei was not uh, very open for, for a, a, a possible uh, conception of phenomenological unconscious. The concept of unconscious affectivity, <coughs> according to me, is compatible with the fact that the self can be represented sometimes much better with that, but with that what he or she cannot tell about him or herself than with the narratives about his or her life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.